So welcome everybody. Thank you uh, uh, very much to uh, ODSC for uh, inviting me again. It's always a pleasure to uh, to meet the community, and uh, I will be in the at the U.S. ODSC conference at the end of October. So thank you in advance for that as well. So uh, indeed, I'm uh, I'm uh, the uh, the evangelist for uh, AI and machine learning at AWS, um, and. Um, and my talk today is about uh, deep learning in the most simple, uh, bullshit-free way possible, okay? So uh, my, my crusade, so to speak, is to, uh, uh, is to show everybody out there that if you can read and write 50 lines of Python, you can do deep learning, okay? So who can read and write 50 lines of Python? Come on, everybody. All right. It's not even 50 in most cases, okay? So let's get started. So indeed, uh, this is the one, the single one thing that gets me aggravated uh, in, in no time is when people make it sound like it's dark magic, okay? Um, and they make it sound complicated and what they really mean is I'm smart, you're not, and pay me a lot of money because I know this, right? Um, so, okay, fair enough. Everybody's got to run their own business. But that doesn't work, right? Because companies, organizations out there need a lot of machine learning and deep learning engineers, and there will never be enough people with PhDs. No, nothing wrong with PhDs, obviously. I don't have one, never needed one, but if you have one, congratulations. Uh, but the fact is that there will never be enough of, uh, of experts uh, out there to serve the machine learning and deep learning needs of companies. And obviously, if you're a developer, you learn a lot of complicated things already. And, and I'm 100% I'm convinced you're smart enough to learn quite a bit about this, okay? So the reality is machine learning and deep learning is a bit of science. Obviously, if you're looking for uh, the, the Turing Award um, in uh, AI, yeah, you, you need to be a genius, you need to have training, you need to have PhDs, etc. But if you're like me and you're just trying to bring deep learning to apps and real life projects and real life organizations, if you're just trying to solve real problems, then you don't need to worry about the science at all. You just need to understand what the technology can do and how to use it. And in that respect, then deep learning is just a bit of code, okay? And like I said, uh, and you can see all those uh, pretty clever uh, deep learning uh, notebooks and examples out there. That it's never 500 lines of code, okay? It's always a, a tiny bit of code because the code isn't really what it's all about. It's about, it's about the data, how you process it, uh, the parameters that you set, but it, it's not a lot of code, so uh, there's that. And you need a few uh, chips, right? And it always sounds funny when I say this in the UK because immediately I think about fish and chips, but no. Uh, but I don't have any other word for it. Chips, right? Uh, and, and of course, you need your uh, Intel CPUs and you need your uh, NVIDIA GPUs and, and well, you might need your uh, Xilinx FPGAs, right? And all three are available on AWS and you can run deep learning workloads on all three. The FPGA world is pretty exotic. I won't talk too much about that, but keep an eye on it. Ask me questions. Uh, there are some new developments that are pretty interesting. So let's get started here. Um, so when we talk about deep learning, we talk about neurons usually, neural networks. Okay, so what's the, what's the story here? Um, we're trying to mimic the human brain, right? And I have to say we're failing a lot <laughs> at this because the brain is complicated and anything we build is very crude. Um, but anyways, we're trying to mimic the biological neuron. And the one thing we know about the biological neuron is that if it's, it has inputs, it's connected to other neurons. And if the inputs are stimulated enough, then the neuron fires an electrical current. If it's not stimulated enough, it doesn't fire. Okay, that's what we need to, uh, that's what we need to uh, mimic in a way. So here's the computer neuron in its uh, simple form, a bunch of inputs, okay, and those will be floating point numbers, nothing complicated. Each input is associated to a weight, more floating point numbers, and the first thing that a neuron does is that multiply and accumulate operation where we take each input multiplied by the corresponding weight and add everything all together, okay? Multiply and accumulate. 
That's about as much math as you will see in this talk, okay? So if you can add and multiply, you're on your way to deep learning greatness, okay? Uh, unfortunately, this doesn't exhibit the behavior that I mentioned, the fact that sometimes it fires, sometimes it doesn't, okay? This will always output some kind of value, this MAC uh, function here. So we need to introduce non-linearity, which is a complicated way to say below a certain threshold, the neuron should not output anything, and, be, um, and beyond that threshold, it should output some kind of value, okay? But that function here is not enough, which is why we need to introduce activation functions, and those are pretty simple math functions that will modify the raw output of the neuron, okay? So over time, a number of activation functions have been uh, designed. I'm sure a PhD thesis have been written on this and probably books as well, so I'm gonna keep it short. Um, the one that is heavily used today is the last one called ReLU. And as you can see, it's a very simple math function. If the input function, if the input value to ReLU is negative, the output is zero. If the, out, if the input is positive, then the output is whatever the input was, okay? So there is that non-linear behavior. Beyond that threshold, nothing happens. After that threshold, something happens, and it could be a very high value. There's no limit to the activation value for ReLU, okay? So that's a neuron, a combination of multiplying weights and inputs, adding all those things together, and then filtering, processing that raw value with an activation function to introduce a non-linear behavior, okay? Fire, no fire, okay? That's the neuron, done. Okay, a neuron by itself does nothing, okay? Neural networks is, is the, the thing we need to work with. So, this is a simple one. This is probably the simplest one you can build. Um, this is called a fully connected network. It's easy to see why because each input is connected to uh, all neurons in the next layer, which themselves are connected to all outputs in the next layer, okay? Fully connected, pretty obvious. So there's an input layer where we will put our data to be predicted. There's an output layer where we will read results. And in the middle, we have at least one extra layer. It's called a hidden layer. And if you wondered why this thing is called deep learning, because usually you have a lot of hidden layers, uh, state-of-the-art networks can have 100, 200 layers, okay? So they get really, really deep, okay? And that hidden layer will compute the multiply and accumulate on the inputs, run the activation functions, propagate to the output layer, and we will read results, okay? So that's the smallest you can build. So of course we need data. So for the sake of the argument, let's say we're trying to predict, to, we're trying to classify images. Okay, so we have a bunch of images, let's say in 10 categories, uh, and we have dogs and cats and elephants and tigers and snakes and anything you like, okay? So let's keep it really simple. We'll take the images, right? We'll flatten them into vectors, okay? And each individual value is a pixel value, okay? And we put those in a matrix that we call X, okay? So each line of X is actually all the pixel values for that first image. And the second line is another image, and so on, and so on, okay? And we have a bunch of images, okay? We, here, we're gonna take the simple road into deep learning, which is called supervised learning. And supervised learning really means you know what the data set looks like, so, okay? So you know the first image is a dog, and you know the second image is a cat, and et cetera, et cetera, okay? You know what your data is, and you want the neural network to learn this representation and be able to predict with additional samples, okay? So X are the images, and Y are the labels, okay? The category numbers. So again, we said 10 categories. So maybe category two is a dog, okay? So the first sample is a dog. The second sample is category zero. Maybe that's a snake, et cetera, et cetera, okay? And obviously we have as many labels as we have samples. But if you've done machine learning before, um, you know that we don't really like to work with category numbers because they don't, they don't tell the truth, right? Um, when I see zero and two and four, I don't know if, uh, 2.5 is a legit, a legit value, 
Okay, and it's not. It's, those are category numbers and they need to be integers. So instead of using those integers, we're going to use a, a technique called one-hot encoding. Again, complicated word for a simple thing. So if we have 10 categories, we're going to replace each label with a vector of 10 bits, and we flip to one the bit that corresponds to the actual category. Okay? So first sample is category two, so we flip bit two to one. Okay? And remember, we start counting at zero, so that's why it's bit three. In case we have less technical people in the room, you never know, but you're still welcome. Okay? Uh, the second sample is category zero, so we flip bit zero to one. Okay? Et cetera, et cetera. One hot encoding. This is how you work with categories when you do machine learning. So this is actually much more expressive because now I know how many categories I have. I just need to look at the size of that vector. And I could also see those zeros and ones as probabilities. Okay? So let's look at the first one here. I know for a fact with 100% chance, right, 100% probability that this first sample is category two, okay? And it's, it has 0% probability of being any other class, okay? In the same way, I know that last sample has 100% chance of being category four and 0% chance of being category zero, of being any other category, sorry. Okay? So this is much more useful because actually, when we're going to predict our new samples, we'll never get zeros and ones, okay? Zeros and ones are a lie anywhere, in computers in the universe. There is no such thing as zeros and ones. It's only about probabilities, right? Sorry to, to break the, the dream of a perfect universe. So we'll never get zeros and ones when we predict. We'll get probabilities between zeros and ones, okay? So that's why it's useful to have this representation here. So how does that work in practice? So let's say we take the first sample in the X matrix and we put each feature, right, each value in, in an input neuron on the input layer, okay? And by the way, yes, this means the input layer has to have as many neurons as you have features, okay? So if I have 10,000 pixels in my image, then yes, I do need 10,000 input neurons, okay? So sizing the input layer is easy. Just pick the number of features that you have. Let's assume the network has been already trained, okay? And I run those multiply and accumulates, and I run those activation functions all the way until the output layer. In a perfect world, I should get this, okay? I should get zeros in all output neurons, except in neuron two, where I should read a perfect 1.00, right? But again, this never happens, as we'll see, okay? The consequence of that is the output layer, when you're trying to solve that kind of classification problem here, the output layer needs to have as many neurons as you have classes. Okay, so sizing the input is easy. Sizing the, sizing the output is easy. The big mess is right in the middle. Okay? So in theory, that's how it works. And of course, we're interested in accuracy, which is uh, the number of uh, predict correct predictions divided by the total number of predictions. And the closest to 100%, the better, okay? So the whole purpose of training is to, is to get to this result, to get uh, an accurate network that predicts, predicts any sample correctly, right? But correctly, that doesn't, means, doesn't mean zeros and ones, as we'll see, okay? It means with a very high probability, Maybe, you know, maybe we'll get 0.01 for the first neuron and 0.02 for the second. But as long as we get 0.9 something for, for neuron two, we'll be happy. It's high enough to tell us it's the right category, okay? Okay, of course it doesn't work like that, okay? It's all a lie initially because the network has not been trained, okay? So initially, when you predict any sample, it gives a completely wrong res result. And it won't even give you that one in the wrong place, okay? It will give you 10 random probabilities because the weights are all random and so the multiply and accumulates and the activations, they yield random results, okay? Random in, random out, okay? That's a fact of life. So when you predict that X1 sample, you don't get the right label, you don't get the right uh, 
probability vector, you get something else, something that's horribly wrong initially. So you need to measure how wrong it is, and we use a loss function to do this. It's a math function that we compute the difference between the real label, the real 10-bit vector, or, or a 10 uh, float vector, those are, those are probabilities, and, and the one that you got. Okay, so it's not as easy as subtracting with them, because those are vectors, but you should not worry too much about those, because all the deep learning libraries, they provide those functions. Okay, the, they have a collection of loss functions that help you compute the error, uh, the prediction error, okay, when you, when you train the network. All right? So we do this. In, and then you could say, okay, uh, you, could, you could say, okay, so we're predicting, measuring the error, and then we're going to do some kind of ma magic tweaking in the, in, the, in the weights to get to a lower error, right? So, okay, yeah, you could do that. You could, you could do the tweaking after each sample, but in most cases you don't do that because it's, it's too slow and it has a number of problems. Usually you work with batches of samples. So we're going to uh, predict, let's say, 32 or 64 samples, one at a time, measure the prediction error for each sample, and then add all the errors together. Okay, and then we're gonna do the tweaking. Okay, it's called mini-batch training, and that's what most people do these days, okay? So, in a nutshell, the purpose of the, tr of the training process is to minimize the prediction error for the data set by gradually adjusting weights, okay? Simple, see? You didn't need a PhD for that. So we're gonna, we have all those knobs, right? Remember all these arrows have a weight, okay? So that's a knob, and you need to tweak those knobs to get to the lowest prediction error, okay? Yes? Is it So reinforcement learning is another technique. Uh, so reinforcement learning starts, so you have supervised learning, which I explained, unsupervised learning, uh, which is for example clustering. Uh, you have, uh, I want to cluster all of you in five groups. So you have a number of features and I run some kind of algo that automatically builds five clusters, okay? But I didn't, I didn't know what the answer was, right? I want to find the answer, so it's unsupervised. And reinforcement, is uh, um, basically, again, learning, uh, learning from scratch how to play uh, Angry Birds or, uh, <laughs> you know, or any kind of video game uh, by uh, letting the, the software run uh, f and, and get some kind of reward for the action, positive or negative, right? Imagine you're trying to learn how to drive a car. If you steer off the cliff, to me, that's negative reward. So you start again and learn that no, don't go left because you're off the cliff, okay? So stay straight for a while and then uh, that's a positive reward until the first turn that you can see, right? And so you drive off the cliff again and say, ah, now nah, I should, okay, so it's straight, straight, straight and then right, see? So it's, it's a bit different. So um, supervised learning is really the simplest one to understand, okay? So we need to train. So we're gonna take the, the, the data set we're going to slice it in batches, and again, the, your favorite deep learning library will do that. And we're going to predict one batch, okay? So sample by sample, predict, find what the error is for that sample, do that for the whole batch, and add up all the errors together, okay? Mini-batch training. And then the tweaking happens, okay? And the tweaking has a complicated name called backpropagation, which means I'm gonna go back from the output layer Okay, back propagation, the contrary of forward propagation. I'm gonna go back from the output layer all the way to the input layer, and I'm gonna do the tweaking. Okay, I'm gonna change the weights, so I'm gonna start here, okay? And I'm gonna change those three weights in a direction that I know minimize error, just a tiny bit, okay? And then I'm gonna do it again for this neuron, and then this neuron, and this neuron, and then, you know, if I had more layers, I would just go walk back through those layers and adjust the weights in a direction that I know will minimize error just a little bit, okay? And obviously, that's the secret sauce. How do you know, right? You have three weights here. How do you know if this one should be increased or decreased, and this one, and this one? Remember, they are floating point values, so you can, only, you can only increase or decrease them. But you need to know in which direction, okay? So 
So I'm delaying the, <laughs> the answer for, for now. But that's what backpropagation does. If we go back through the network for that batch and just do the tweaking weight by weight. Okay? And then you run the second batch. Okay? Here we go. And you do the same thing. Do more tweaking. Okay? And you do it again and again and again and again until you get to the end of the data set. Okay? And this is called an epoch. Why did they, didn't they call that a round or, I don't know. I hate that mumbo jumbo, right? And you do it again. You run another epoch, and then another one, and then another one, and then another one. And when you train from scratch on large data sets, it's, it's quite common to train for 100, 200 epochs. Okay? So now you see why you need those fast GPUs and CPUs and, and so on. Okay? It's, it's math and compute intensive. Okay? So, of course, there are some parameters here. So the batch size is important. Okay? You need to choose that one wisely. If it's too big, you don't get too much shots, too many shots at backpropagation. If it's too small, you might get a lot of shots at backpropagation, and then training is fairly slow, and, and you have other problems. The learning rate dictates uh, the, the amount of the, uh, the size of the adjustments that you make to the weights. Okay? We'll see that in a minute. Again, if it's too small, you make very tiny adjustments. It takes forever to train. If you make very large adjustments, you, you could be swinging wildly between large values and never reaching the correct value for a given weight. Okay, that's the intuition. And the number of epochs is, like I said, how many times will you go through the full data set? Okay? And these are called hyperparameters, and picking those um, is difficult, right? You can start with reasonable values, but finding the optimal values is a whole new thing. And, and there are more automatic techniques called hyperparameter optimization, uh, which is basically using machine learning to figure out what those things are. Okay? Machine learning within machine learning. Welcome to the matrix. Okay, yes? Just, does the first batch have the randomization and the weights, and then the second batch uses the same? Absolutely, yes. Okay, we start with random weights, and then, uh, so the first batch would be, uh, a disaster, right, when it comes to accuracy. But pretty quickly, as you build on, on top, you keep adjusting the same weights, right? And you make the right decisions all the time, right? You always update them in the right direction, quote unquote, then obviously it will improve over time, okay? Uh, yeah, should have mentioned it. Thank you for reminding me. So how do you know that this works, okay? The training process lasts for a while, and you'd like to know if it's if it's working or not. So we use a different part of the data set called the validation data set. And at the end of each epoch, we're going to predict this data set. Okay? And since we're doing supervised learning, again, we can compare the predicted values with the real values, and hopefully the validation accuracy is going up. Okay? Which tells me, yeah, just a sec, which tells me uh, I can, uh, this network can predict samples that it hasn't seen before. Okay, this is called generalization. It's really important because the samples you're going to send to that model during production are samples that it hasn't seen before. Okay, so it's not good enough to learn the training samples. You need to learn other. You need to be able to predict other samples that haven't been used for training. Yes, sir. <laughs> Yes, so there's a, there is an extra uh, parameter or set of parameters in the network called the bias, which is a fixed value uh, that you plug into each layer, right? But in the interest of simplicity, uh, I'm, I'm <laughs> leaving this one under the, the carpet. But yeah, you need to also learn the bias, okay? But it doesn't change much. I mean, the, the, the basic idea is still the same, okay? So at the end of each epoch, I'm going to predict, and I hope to see my validation accuracy going up. OK? Good. And then, how do I know, once I'm completely done training, and I saw my training accuracy going up, fine, and I saw my validation accuracy going up as well, very happy, how do I measure, I would say, the accuracy of this model versus the one that I trained last month or, or two months before? 
What, what's the benchmark for this model? So the good practice here, the best practice, is to, is to use another data set, or it could be a fraction of the initial data set, called the test set, that you predict once you're completely done tweaking. Okay, so you make no more changes to the network and you run the test set to get some kind of benchmark. And the reason why you need that is because you will use, obviously, the training set to train. You will use the validation set to measure accuracy and generalization. And then you're going to go and tweak the network again. So as you experiment, you will actually use the validation data set to make decisions maybe on the network itself or on the parameters. Okay, so there's a, there's a bias here that you're introducing and it, the validation accuracy is not an honest benchmark of your model. You need to have something else that is run at the very end and you don't make any decisions on the network using that accuracy. Okay, so you need those three data sets. Okay, so the training process is pretty simple. It's an iterative thing and, uh, and, and back propagation runs and then the validation data set gives me a hint on how well I'm generalizing, etc. The one question I haven't answered is, how the hell do I know in which direction weights should be updated? Right? Okay, so let's take a simple example. Ignore all the text. Just look at the picture here. So what are we really trying to do? Okay? I'm trying, let me go back to, uh, oh yeah, this one here. Okay? Let's look at this one here. I have a function here with three parameters, the weights, okay, and they yield a result, the loss, okay, and what I'm trying to do is to find the three parameters that give me the smallest possible loss, okay, for that neuron, and then same thing for all other neurons, all right. So I can't plot things in, uh, in four dimensions, not on the slides and not in my head, so let's stick to three dimensions, okay? So here I've got a function with two parameters, and you could see those as weights. And they output a value, and you could see that as the prediction error, the loss. Okay, and let's say I plot function f, and I find something like this. Okay, this nice 3D graph. Okay, and the intuition here is I want to get to the x and y that give me the lowest z, right? So I want to walk down that slope and get to the lowest point, all right? So of course, initially, x and y are random. So I'm gonna start maybe here, and I'd like to get here, okay? So that's maybe x, and that's maybe y, and these are the weights that I want because they give me the lowest error. Okay, so you could say, well, okay, it's a simple function. I can compute x and y. Okay, yeah, maybe. But imagine you have hundreds of weights, okay, hundreds of parameters, maybe thousands of parameters. It cannot be computed. They have to be estimated, okay? They have to be discovered. That's the thing. That's why we have this iterative process, because we can't compute those weights. So we're going to start somewhere. And then we, if we take a step in the right direction, and I'm putting quotes all around that, I will get a little lower. And then if I take another step in the right direction, I still get a little lower. And again, and again, and again. And step by step, I'm getting to that lowest point. And I get X and Y that give me the lowest error. Okay, that's the intuition. I say intuition a lot because the math behind some of those things is so complicated that unless you are a, a proper expert, you'll never understand it. But you can easily build an intuition for what it does. Okay? And that's very, very important. It help, helps me a lot because I'm not smart enough to go through the, the real equations. And I don't think I want to anyway. So, so then the last question I need to answer is, okay, where the hell is the right direction? Okay? So I'm going to take you back to high school for a second. Okay, for some of us it's a long time ago. For some of you it could be just a few years away, right? Lucky you. So, remember derivatives? Ah, man, yeah, sure, of course. <laughs> what a nightmare, okay? Okay, remember derivatives. You have a, a, a curve, any kind of curve, and you compute the derivative in any point on that curve, and what do you get? You get the slope, right? And once you know what the slope is, you know which way is up and you know which way is down. Right? There you go. Isn't this what we want? 
The only thing here, obviously, is we have multiple parameters, so we need to compute partial derivatives for each of those parameters. So at here, if you compute the partial derivative with respect to x, we'll know which way is down with respect to x. Same thing for y. So if we take a step in the right direction for x and the right direction for y, there we go. We get to a lowest z. And we do that again and again and again. Okay? And now some of you probably think, you said no math, you bastard, right? So yeah, that's what I said, but the good thing is you'll never have to worry about this because again, the deep learning libraries do this for you, okay? But you need to understand how this works, okay? So it's mostly high school math, okay? Or maybe uh, freshman math, freshman level math, but it's not much more than that, okay? So this is how we know where to go partial derivatives, okay? And the steps, the learning rate that I mentioned is the step size, okay? So if you have a large learning rate, you will take large steps down the mountain. If you have a small learning rate, you will take small steps. So now you see why it shouldn't be too big, it shouldn't be too small, right? Obviously, in real life, it could be ugly. It could look something like this, right? And that's the nightmare of uh, many a deep learning practitioner. Imagine you start here and you walk down the mountain and you, you end up here, right? And it's called a local minimum. And anywhere you look is up, so you're staying there. And the problem here, of course, is the error is higher than here. So this is probably where you want to go, okay? So how do we avoid those things? Um, saddle points are another nightmare. This is a saddle point. It's like a horse saddle. So visualize that one in your head. Imagine you end up right at the saddle point. Okay? Here's a better view. We'll go back to the previous one. Okay? That red ball here stops. Why? Because in this direction, this place is a minimum. Okay? And as you know from high school, we get zero derivative, and so we don't update weights anymore. There is no more slope. In this dimension, it is a maximum. And again, we get a zero derivative in this direction, so we don't update weights. And this is why that red ball stops moving. This is called a saddle point. Okay, so that's probably even worse than a local minimum. So to make a long story short, um, a few years ago, uh, Ian Goodfellow, one of the leading guys in, uh, in AI, uh, that's an understatement. Well, sorry, sir. Um, wrote an article saying, well, um, basically looking at lots of different trainings with typical neural uh, network architectures, he, he figured out that yes, you see those things, okay? Those local uh, minima seem to exist, so they, they definitely are present, but for reasons not quite clear, we tend to avoid them, okay? And m most of the reason is actually uh, that uh, uh, walking down the mountain process is always a little bit noisy. So you never exactly end up in a place where that you can't escape, right? That's a very crude way of explaining it. If you want the details, go to that article, okay? Um, so that, um, sorry, oh, that algo, I forgot to mention it, walking down the mountain step by step by computing derivatives is called SGD. It's, it's even older than me. Uh, it had nothing to do with machine learning initially, but it became popular. It works very well. It is very robust, okay? But over time, more optimizers have been implemented, and this is what you see here. They all have weird names, and the, the modern ones, all the ADA star family, meaning adaptative, can actually, as you can see, speed up or speed, speed up down the slope. Is that proper English? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, they can accelerate down the slope because they know what the, where the slope is and they can modify the learning rate to take bigger steps. And that's why you see the, that yellow guy you know, zooming by because that algo knows where the slope is and it will literally run down the slope, okay? Um, so many, many more algos out there. So to summarize any, everything, um, if you plot all those things, you'll see something like this, training accuracy going 200%, given enough time. 
loss accordingly going to zero, almost zero, but you might see validation accuracy going uh, to uh, 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 climbing and then dropping after a while, okay? And uh, the problem here is called overfitting, and you need to avoid that at all time, uh, at all cost. You basically spend too much time training and you can't generalize anymore to uh, additional samples, okay? So the best way to do this is to save, to save the weights after each epoch, okay? It's called checkpointing and all the libraries support that. And, and then after training is complete, you just plot that thing and you see what the best epoch is, okay? All right, um, so let's look at a few uh, other architectures, okay? So we talked about fully connected networks. But you, I'm sure you've heard about um, CNNs, convolutional neural networks, okay? And they're the kings of anything that is image related. And um, I can't go into the full explanation, um, but you will get the slides obviously, and I've got other longer talks when I go into all the details. The idea here is starting from, a, from, a, from images, right, to use filters, to use the convolution operation, which is a pretty simple math operation, to extract features. So we're applying filters to images, right? Different filters, and we're extracting information from that, and then we shrink them using another operation called pooling, subsampling, okay? And we do it again and again and again until we have a collection of very weird-looking tiny images that, have nothing, that are nothing like the initial image, but um, that still contain interesting information. And then I can flatten all that stuff, build a big vector, and use a fully connected network. Okay, this is the simplest uh, CNN you could build. Okay, so just rounds of extracting features with filters, and uh, just like you would do uh, with your favorite image app. Uh, here's an example here. Running a small filter three by three over that image will yield that. Okay, so it's an edge detector. And if we knew what that animal was here, we'd still know here. It's enough information to know what that animal is. And we threw away all the unwanted information. Okay, so of course, the, how do you know which values to use here? Well, now you know the answer, you learn them. Okay, when you train on a CNN, the, the, the kernels, the filters is what you actually learn. Okay, and then you can shrink the images uh, by keeping the, the highest value in the pixels, and, and you do it again and again and again. Okay, so very, uh, very simple in a way. Uh, and of course you could do very complex things in the end. Uh, you can do uh, image classification. You can do image detection, figuring out where objects are. And you could do segmentation, finding the boundaries of images. Okay, so you could use a data set, you could label that data set, uh, and you could train with a complex model again and again and again and again to get pretty good results, right? Or maybe you don't want to do it because you're lazy like me, which is a virtue as we know, and you just need to do classification or detection. And you could go and grab a pre-trained model, a model that has already been trained on a very large data set, and, and basically write four lines of code to load your image run it through the pre-trained model and get results, okay? And this is an example with a, an open source library called Gluon, okay? It's on, it's on GitHub. Uh, it's part of the MXNet project that we, uh, that we support. And those examples are literally four lines of code, okay? And the networks involved are crazy complicated, but you don't need to worry about that too much. Okay, just load them, predict, get your result, okay? Using pre-trained models is a powerful technique. And you can do other things like phase detection, uh, face recognition, and, uh, and this uh, recent project actually gets extremely high accuracy on, on reference data sets. Okay, this, uh, uh, this is available on GitHub, you can go and grab it. Both are MXNet projects. Uh, but sometimes you need to do more than images, right? What about text? What about translation? What about predicting Bitcoin prices? Bah, don't bother. <laughs> okay? So we need a new type of neuron because the neuron we saw so far has no memory, right? Uh, that basic neuron, you could predict 
10 images in any order, you would always get the same results for an individual image. It doesn't remember the past predictions. So when you're trying to translate maybe English to French, of course, uh, you don't translate word for word. For a translation for a given word kind of depends on the translation, the past few translations, okay? You need context. So you need a neuron that remembers the past few predictions. And this is the LSTM neuron, and that's a weird name. Long, short term, how could something be long and short? Again, not, not a really smart name if you ask me. Uh, they have short term memory because they remember the past few predictions, and they are used in long networks, okay? So how about long networks with short term memory? Something like that. That would make more sense. And they're great at predicting sequences of data, where, like, like I said, translation, and uh, we have an open source project called AWS Sockeye, okay? Um, uh, it's on GitHub, and it, is, it implements a pretty complex um, LSTM architecture, and you can go and grab it and train your own translation models, okay? So if you have a data set for uh, uh, English to uh, Russian, let's say, right? It, you, could, uh, you could learn, and uh, you could learn it and, and build a model with that. Okay, and this is based on the LSTM. Now, here's a, a really recent example. Anybody knows Tesseract? All right, yeah, it's a really great open source project to do OCR. And um, they use traditional techniques so far, and in the last version called four, it's 4.0, it's still beta, it's very new, it came out in June, I think. Um, they're actually using an LSTM architecture to improve the accuracy. And this is an example I, reused from that great blog down there. And uh, as you can see, this is a, uh, it's a receipt, right? And those are notoriously difficult to uh, understand and extract information from because they're all a tiny bit different. So you can't really generalize. And, uh, and the result is, is pretty good, I think, right? So, uh, so all hail the age of LSTM for expense reports, hopefully, right? That will save me a lot of time. <laughs> But that's great, but that's a little bit boring. So can we be silly with uh, deep learning? Of course we can be silly. So let's be silly for a second. So anybody who's seen this talk before cannot play the game, right? <laughs> Especially you. <laughs> but um, does anybody here recognize those people? I know you're all working very hard, but you must be watching TV, right? Come on. No? No ID? All right. Okay, I can't fool people anymore with this now. They, they know the trick. These faces do not exist. These people do not exist. They're fake. They're completely fake. Okay, so th those faces have been generated by uh, a network architecture called GAN, Generative Adversarial Network. Um, it's uh, definitely out of scope to explain how they work today. Uh, you, you, can, you can look it up. It's not that, not that weird. But the idea is really... Um, to start from a data set of samples and to generate samples that look like, that are similar to the ones that are present in the data set. And it's not as easy as cut and paste or, or you know, computing random statistics. It, those are really generated pixel by pixel. Okay. And now everybody's familiar to, with that because of deep fakes and all the fun and not so fun applications of deep fakes. Uh, this is a TensorFlow project. So here's another example. So if, if you remember when you were five-year-old or if, you're, if you have kids, right, you have those on your fridge, and, uh, and this is called a semantic map, okay? And a semantic map uh, it just contains outlines of objects with different colors. So blue is for cars and green is for trees, I suppose, and uh, that whatever that color is is the, is the road and, and so on. And, and you, so you, tr you build a data set like that with real images and semantic maps saying, okay, here's the car and here's the road and that's the, use the same color for everything, okay? And now, if you have a trained model, you can take that semantic map, that's your new sample, okay? You can draw one yourself and you can ask the neural network to generate it, okay? So you go from semantic map to high resolution picture, okay? Uh, and uh, this one is, is, uh, is very impressive. This is a PyTorch project, okay, and there are more. Okay, so GANs, generating new samples 
based on an existing data set. Okay? It's going to make fake news very, very interesting. Um, the last thing I want to touch upon is um, an emerging trend. It's more than a trend, I think. Is as you can imagine, uh, those things are crazy uh, computation heavy, right? Um, let me show you a basic example. A few more minutes. Here we go. Okay, so I'm running on my Mac here, okay? And this is a simple MXNet script to learn uh, a toy data set called MNIST. And I, I, I sure hope that in 2018 everybody has heard about MNIST, right? If not, okay, that's fine. You can catch up. <laughs> it's an image data set with digits from zero to nine. It's good for nothing. It's just a toy data set, but it's a good one to play with, okay? And I'm building a simple, fully connected layer. This is MXNet code in Python. And as you can see, it is not a lot of code. Okay, 32 lines. And I'm just piling up layers. Okay, the fully connected layer and the activation layer, etc. Okay, it doesn't really matter what we do here. A simple, fully connected network. Okay, so let's run this thing. Just to get a sense of how fast it goes. That's the thing I'm interested in. Okay, so simple fully connected network on a toy data set on my old Mac. Okay, I can run an epoch in 2.2 seconds. All right, that's fast, right? I could train for 200 epochs in a few minutes. Okay, fair enough. So keep, hold that thought, 13,000 samples per second, okay, that I can learn. Now let's look at the same data set with a simple CNN, and this is really pretty much the, the CNN that you saw on my slide, okay? Two convolution slash pooling blocks, which is probably the, simple you could, the simplest you could do, okay? Let's run this on my machine again. 13,000 for the previous one. Ah, oh, nope. That was way too fast. Right. Okay, here's the CNN. Hmm. I can drink a little bit. Right? How's your day going? <laughs> hmm, okay. About 30 to 40 times slower. So now each epoch is not going to be two seconds, it's going to be, let's say, 70 seconds, right? Or 80 seconds. And this is, this is a ridiculously simple data set. Now, going back to things like this, now you see what the problem is going to be, right? We need massive, massive processing power, okay? So you can train on CPUs, um, and yeah, on AWS, I'm not here to talk about AWS specifically, but you'll find CPU instances and GPU instances and FPGA instances, and you get all the processing power that you need there. But uh, a lot of companies are now moving into building um, hardware dedicated to machine learning and deep learning. So Google built uh, their own uh, ASIC, application-specific IC, called uh, the TPU. Uh, Intel is working on a generation of chips called Nirvana. Xilinx uh, just announced a generation of new FPGA for deep learning called Everest, and I'm sure there are a million startups out there who are working on that. And there, okay, so that's cool, and I, I'm sure eventually those will be used and they will be available in clouds and et cetera, et cetera. Fine. But the, the specific interest here is that you can't just take a deep learning model and, and run it efficiently off on one of those chips. You need to optimize it for that hardware. You need to make some trade-offs. And these are more advanced topics, but just to get you thinking, um, you can use techniques like quantization. So quantization will actually not use floating points for uh, activations and weights, okay? Because floating point arithmetic is slow, and it needs, um, it, it eats a lot of power, okay? 
And if you want to deploy uh, uh, deep learning models at the edge, right, in uh, you know, glasses or tiny cameras, etc., the power budget that you get is way too small for that. Okay? So quantization really means training models with uh, smaller precision than floats. Okay? So people have tried, they've moved from 32-bit floats to 32-bit, uh, uh, to, uh, to integers, and then they went to, uh, uh, they went to uh, 16-bit integers, and then they tried eight, and now you even have projects where they train with single-bit weights. So uh, that's easy, right? I'm sure it trains faster, <laughs> because uh, a weight can either be zero or one, right? Which tends to break everything I've explained so far, but as it turns out, uh, you can actually do this, if you're clever, and at, at, at the expense of slightly lower precision, okay, you lose accuracy when you use uh, tiny weights like that, but um, you save a lot of time predicting, because you're not predicting with floating point arithmetic, you're predicting, predicting with uh, integer or uh, even binary arithmetic, which is way faster, and again, the, the, the power budget is much lower. Okay, so quantization. If you can't sleep tonight, just look it up. Quantization, deep learning, welcome to my world. Uh, the next thing, the next technique that, that is really uh, applied is called, and uh, I forgot to mention, uh, some of the popular deep learning libraries already support that, okay? Uh, TensorFlow, MXNet, they used uh, that reduced precision training. So it's not science fiction, it's being used today. Uh, pruning is going to remove, to, to shrink uh, networks because Typically, uh, we, uh, one of the problems is we tend to build networks that are too complicated, too big. They have too many connections. You know, it's, uh, uh, we go big too quickly. Okay? So we end up having large neural networks that are maybe you know, 150 megabytes or 200 megabytes. And again, it's not a problem on the server. Uh, it, it's a problem at the edge. Okay? Um, and so we need smaller, faster, more efficient models, okay? And so pruning is a technique that removes useless connections, okay? So you wanna know how, how to figure out which one is useless? Okay, again, out of scope for today. But it's, it's an interesting technique. Again, you shrink the model, it becomes smaller, faster. For embedded applications, it's really important. And the last one is basically compression, okay, which is a simple technique. Um, instead of encoding weights, if, instead of using, let's say, 32-bit uh, or 16-bit weights, uh, you can just use uh, traditional compression algorithms to make them smaller. And again, uh, it shrinks the models and it, uh, it helps uh, save memory. Okay? And all these techniques are interesting per se, but in the context of machine learning hardware and deep learning hardware and embedded deep learning, they are critical. There is a lot of research going on there. Okay, and uh, you'll find you know, NVIDIA as well and, and Xilinx and everybody is pushing a lot in this direction to figure out how to shrink those models and make them efficient everywhere, not just on big fat servers. Okay? Um, so here the, the, the main concern is really prediction, right? It's because training will always happen in the cloud, right? Uh, you, you're not gonna, uh, there are some applications where you can, uh, you, you know, your mobile phone or your, your connected glasses can learn from scratch, doing unsupervised learning, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But most apps will be trained in the cloud, so you know, power is not really an issue, space is not an issue. But then you take that model. Imagine you you need to deploy it to one million uh, water pumps or you know, ten million. Uh, uh, 10 million uh, connected glasses or uh, 10 million video cameras. You know, the smaller it is, the easier it is to deploy and uh, the less hardware you need to actually run it. Okay? So you apply those techniques during training, of course, right? but they will yield results during prediction. Okay? Does that answer your question? Thanks. Okay, I'm almost out of time. Um, a question I get a lot is, okay, well, you, now thanks for the headache. I knew I should have had that extra coffee. Um, uh, this, is over, this is fascinating, yeah? Yeah. 
Uh, thanks for the vote of confidence. But it is overwhelming if, if it's the first time you hear about it. And I, I fully realize it, and it's one of my goals, is to over, overwhelm you a little bit, but at the same time, show you that you can get started, OK? Like I did, pretty much. Okay. So how did I do it is the question I get a lot. So I wrote a blog post um, on Medium. It's in two parts. And as you can see, the title is The 10 Steps to Deep Learning. I'm not claiming it's the absolute best way. Uh, it's all, uh, it all comes from my experience and talking to a few people. And this is what I think uh, 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 these are what I think the, the, the reasonable steps in the right order to get started with this. Okay? So if you're, a, if you're a developer, or even if you're not a developer, because I guess the first step is learn Python, <laughs> if I remember correctly. But if you already know Python, okay, you already passed step one. Okay? So you're not, not starting from scratch. And, and I'm trying to push math and theory as far down the list as possible. It is there at some point, because if you want a finer understanding of how, the, how those things works, yeah. You, you need to understand a bit of math, but you can do a lot without a line of math, okay? Using pre-trained models, using high-level libraries like TensorFlow, MXNet, PyTorch, etc. It's not math, it's code, okay? But it's good if you understand what's happening under the hood. It helps you debug and uh, and tune your networks, okay? So hopefully that helps. Um, if you have feedback, uh, some people wrote to me later on and say, you know, I tried it and I might step eight and yeah, it's uh, okay, now it's getting hard, but I, I learned a lot. So it seems to work for a lot of people, okay? So my 10 steps, hope you like them. Uh, if you want additional resources, uh, these are the ones that I would uh, recommend you look at. Uh, so if you're interested in uh, machine learning on AWS, uh, SageMaker, and all the cool services that we have uh, to help you build and scale your uh, machine learning workflows. Just go to ml.aws, simple URL. Um, we have uh, a, an AI blog, machine learning blog, uh, with code and uh, uh, customer, uh, customer examples and uh, all kinds of good things, which, uh, which you may like. Uh, I mentioned Gluon, that one of those high-level libraries to, uh, uh, to uh, get started. Uh, why not? Uh, it's, a, it's not a bad choice. Uh, you could use TensorFlow or anything else, but hey, Gluon is there as well. It has excellent documentation, especially for beginners, so that's why I'm recommending it. And um, here's the URL to my blog where you'll find uh, lots of stuff, uh, some AWS stuff, but not only, so uh, take a look and, uh, and uh, send me some feedback. Uh, by now, I've got a pretty big collection of uh, talks and videos on, uh, on YouTube as well from AWS events and third-party conferences. So uh, if you want more of this, um, there, there is more. Um, I have longer versions of this talk and, uh, uh, or maybe versions of this talk where I insisted on something else. So it might be interesting if you, if you want to uh, share it with our colleagues or watch it later, etc. And of course, I've got some code on uh, GitLab. So two different repos uh, with um, um, MXNet code and, uh, and uh, a bunch of notebooks for uh, all kinds of libraries uh, that you can go, uh, go and grab, okay? And most of them correspond to, to blog articles. So there you go. Um, thanks very much for, uh, for listening, me, uh, listening to me today. Thanks again to uh, ODSC for the, the kind uh, invite. Uh, if you want to stay in touch, um, Twitter or obviously LinkedIn, but Twitter if, is the easiest way. If you have questions, if you're looking for resources, uh, if uh, you have uh, built something very cool that you want to share, like uh, Cosmin here. Uh, this guy is a crazy, crazy uh, uh, data science blogger. So uh, I want to see more of that. And uh, please send me your articles, and, uh, and I'm more than happy to share them with, uh, with my followers as well. Thanks again, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. And I'll hang around for questions, of course, if you have questions. Thank you so much. Thank you.